Welcome to Truest Blood, the official True Blood podcast. I'm Kristen Bauer. And I'm Deborah Ann Wool. And you've been invited in. I want to do bad things with you. On Truest Blood. Welcome back to Truest Blood, where we sink our fangs into the series episode by episode. This week, we discuss Release Me, written by Ryle Tucker and directed by Michael Ruscio, who also happens to be the series editor. It's episode 207. Yay! Yay! And our characters are trapped, both emotionally and literally, and only the truth can set them free. So we'll talk about all the drama, both past and present, and let you in on some behind-the-scenes secrets. Then we have the effervescent Mariana Clavino with us to share all her stories about playing the infamous Lorena, maker of the broodiest of vampires, Bill Compton. Mariana was only four years into her professional film career when she booked the breakout role, and she hasn't slowed down since, with series regular and recurring roles on Devious Maids, Stalker, Designated Survivor, and the upcoming Superman and Lois. She is a vision, and it's all about her and Bill this week on True Blood. A drunk and muddy Andy Belfler in search of a pig stumbles upon Marianne's orgy. He manages enough of a distraction, allowing Sam to escape her clutches. Unfortunately, Andy and Sam are the last standing in Bon Tom as all their friends and neighbors are caught under Marianne's spell. But finally, Sam gets some answers from Daphne. What the fuck is she? She's gone, dum-dum. Daphne professes her love to Marianne, who repays that love with a dagger to Daphne's heart, wielded by an enchanted eggs. Back in Dallas, Eric is losing patience with Godric's vampire underlings, and Sookie has been gone too long. She and Hugo are locked in the church basement. When Steve Newland discovers her connection to Jason, things go from bad to worse. Meanwhile, in sweeter news, Hoyt and Jessica are having a sleepover. Oh, we could cuddle, if you like. Just don't freak out if I look a little... dead. After sharing the respective sex histories, or lack thereof, they agree to be each other's firsts. In the hopefully soundproof room next door, Lorena continues to keep Bill from going to Sookie's rescue. They pass the day recalling the last time they were together. Bill had grown into his vampire adolescence and no longer wanted to spend eternity killing people with his mommy. William Compton, you're still so sensitive. Some might say it's a weakness, but I've always found it oddly cute. So desperate to free himself from her hold, he actually placed a stake to his own heart. To save his life, Lorena let him go, releasing her magical hold on him as his maker. In the church balcony, Jason and Sarah try to reckon with their infidelity. Sarah, by dreaming of becoming Mrs. Stackhouse, and Jason, thinking mostly about Steve and all his guns. When Steve instead threatens him because of Sookie, Jason needs a minute to catch up. I know who you are and who you're working for. The, the road crew? <laughs> With his sister in danger, Jason goes full-blown action hero and escapes from Steve only to be shot in the heart by an enraged Sarah Newlin. In the basement, Sookie is viciously attacked by Steve's henchman, Gabe, but is rescued just in time by a skinny, tattooed, 15-year-old boy named Godric. So Hoyt and Jess are <laughs> so freaking adorable. <laughs> well, we're, we're the and, only ones having a good time right now, I feel like. <laughs> you, and you are having the sweetest, best time yeah. And there was so much sweet stuff in the commentary about you two. Like when Michael Ruscio, the director, yeah. and the writer, Rail Tucker, were talking, when you two came on screen, they go, aww. <laughs> they both went, aww. It was really, really cute. Which and is they great. say, yeah. They say, aww, we love them. <laughs> They're so cute, moving, loving, and refreshing, and completely compelling and believable. And aww. here I'm really going to embarrass you. 
Because Rael says, Oh, no. Rusio, Deb seems to glow. I've never seen mm -hmm. anything like it. And they're going back and forth. One of them says, She's beautiful in person, but the camera, she's like a oh. 30s movie star. Oh, that's so nice. That's it's so, so nice. nice. They mentioned it, and I, I think it's cute that Hoyt and Jess are kind of like the poster kids for how to lose your virginity. <laughs> like yeah. this yeah. sort of open conversation, the consent, the sweetness, but yeah. also the enthusiasm and excitement for it. Because yeah. I remember one thing that Jim and I decided to do, because in the script, it actually starts with like them just sitting on the bed talking and she's still mm -hmm. got the flowers. And we were like, I don't know, when you're a teenager, do you remember like you could just make out for like hours, right? Like hours. you could just mack on yeah, each other right. until your lips were chapped right like that's I such a know, teenager right? thing and so we were like i feel like yeah. we should hop in on them having just like marathon make out yes and then and then let it kind of break apart with hoyt having to be like i need to tell you something because i can't keep doing this for much longer and i love i love a couple of things yeah. one is was this the scene in the commentary they said that you and Jim wanted to rehearse it like a theater scene. We we've, we've rehearsed a lot of things. So the, I think actually the rehearse like a theater scene's coming up in the next episode. Okay. Jim and I rehearsed almost every scene we ever did together because we enjoy yeah, that process. Great. You found stuff. Yeah, we found stuff. And I think also it allowed us to get really comfortable with one another. You know, and I I can share this this now I think and Jim and I talk about it a little bit later as well when we speak with him in our interview. He and I were in relationships and we didn't want to yeah. sacrifice or make them uncomfortable in any way. But we also wanted to tell a really believable and true love story. And so we actually had yeah. a conversation, you know, feelings come up when you do scenes like this and, and sure. the appropriate feelings, the kind of like young love feelings. Yeah. And they're yeah. real, but they're also based on fiction, you know, so you have to keep a very level yeah. head about it. And, you know, Jim and I had a very frank conversation about how we were going to be totally accepting of those feelings, but we were yeah. only going to act on them from action to cut, right? So that right. everything else outside, even during rehearsals, was going to be very above board, very respectful of our other relationships. But we were going to take mm -hmm. advantage of the fact that one naturally kind of mm -hmm. has these feelings arise and let that be really present during the actual scenes. And I think that that really made a, for a beautiful relationship on camera. It does. And I think, you know, because I had that with Alex mm -hmm. and not a romantic way, but I always felt like how lucky. Yeah. Right. Because you could be in a scene with someone that you don't have any of that kismet yeah. with. Yeah. Yeah. But you can borrow from your real feelings. Yes, and and it means that how you feel wonderful. it's really exciting, right? Every time action is it called, is. you're like, oh, you know, we get to sort of live in this space that we've agreed on yeah. that's very safe. And yeah. really go for it. You know, it doesn't, it's not going to yeah. be the awkward, like, oh, is it okay? Or can I, we've rehearsed, we've had these conversations. We already yeah. know exactly what, and then it's interesting because I look at that and I think, oh, that's the kind of work an intimacy coordinator does, which is sort of a new addition oh. to our business. We didn't have yeah. that back in the days that we were shooting this, but the work that Jim and I were, were doing was that work. It was the kind of. Okay sharing and managing of expectations and and things like that, being really clear about what boundaries were. It was a great, great thing. And especially when it's emotionally vulnerable as well, because, you know, Hoyt and yes. Jessica both have to share some very emotionally scary stuff this episode. I know. And throughout, yeah. you know. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It feels so much better as an actor when you're not entirely just living in your own head yes but you're <laughs> you're playing a, a you know I'm a tennis watcher so it's like you're hitting the ball back and forth with someone right and right. it just raises your game yes. right and you you're in a flow and you're feeling it yeah and you know I think the camera picks up on it but whether or not it does you do yes. so you go home going wow I really made something with somebody yeah and, and in a way as an actor I feel like that has to matter the most to you just did you yeah. have an experience did they have an experience and kind of go well I hope they caught it you know <laughs> exactly um, the rest is out of my hands moving yeah, on right. you know this clip is really cute because <laughs> I love what you say in it and I don't want to ruin it 
but like, it's just such a teen and I'm, I'm going to bring it back. I, I'm going to bring this back and say this in my life. I ain't never done it. With a girl, I mean. What have you done it with? <sighs> just myself. Oh, so you're a virgin. Oh. <laughs> Well, well, big whoop, so am I. Big whoop. <laughs> it's it's big it's whoop. Ryle Tucker, really, who's fantastic. <laughs> I just love that she misunderstands fantastic. him. That he's like, I've never done it with a girl, and she's like, Oh no, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> what have you done it? What, then have, what have you done, done it with? with? <laughs> he has to. He has to come back from that somehow. <laughs> Somehow, and you know, you can only come back halfway because then you have to go, well, just with my myself, myself, you know, which is- and it's like, oh, okay, let's not talk about that right now. Poor Hoyt. Like, right? But Poor it, Hoyt. But then again, in that moment, and this is again why I think this is brilliant. So yes, that I'm, I'm with you. You can only come back about halfway from that. But then what's amazing <laughs> is because I'm sure in Hoyt's heart, he's going, every girl's going to think it's a big whoop that I'm a virgin. They're all going to mm. think I'm such a freak and a weirdo. And she instead mm-hmm. goes, big whoop, right? Big whoop. So in a way, he can only come back halfway, but she brings him back the rest of the way, I think, Jessica. And, totally. and they're right back on the same page, which is why they can agree to be each other's first. You know, she says, I'm not like other girls. I'd happily yeah. be your first if you'd like. Aww. Yeah. Aww. See, that's why we all do that. <laughs> And then we have the most adorable scene coming up with Hoyt has gotten up early to set up the room to make it special with blood yeah. slash soup scented candles. I know that line is funny, too. To me, they smell like soup. And we have um, a, a very famous song called Bleeding Love playing during this scene, which is pretty perfect and became kind of a yeah. Hoyt and Jessica anthem. Every time I hear it, I think of them, or at least I think of uh-huh. Jim, which is, which is fun. Sure. But the interesting thing for it is it was written by a man for a man to sing. It was written by Ryan Tedder of One Republic and Jesse McCartney for McCartney's next album. And I always like that because when I think, when I really listen to the mm. lyrics, it does sound like a teenage boy's diary. But it turns out the record company didn't really like it. So mm-hmm. when Tedder... They were like, this sounds like a teenage boy's teenage diary. Teenage boy's diary. <laughs> um... So when they they had uh, heard Leona Lewis, who had just been on X Factor, and they rearranged it for her, loved her voice, and it debuted at number one, and it was on the charts and like kind of unbeaten wow. for a while for a British female solo artist. So it became this huge hit when they sort of rearranged it for a woman's voice, which I think is really fun. So interesting. Yeah. So interesting. And then because we had this huge budget, they could get they could songs get like an that. actual song. Yeah, like that. So it's cool. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. And then we also have some fun stuff going on in Bon Ton with Marianne and all those enchanted people there. We sure do. <laughs> we sure do. There's a couple funny tidbites. Yes, tidbites. All so right. So what do you think of that? Did you catch that? <laughs> I caught that. Some tidbites. Uh-huh. So we can start with, let's see, I think Andy, I think, first of all, sort of sums up what's happening in Bon Ton very well. He accomplishes <laughs> it all in about a quarter of a page. I love him. With a ball mask and these giant claws claws uh-huh and the whole town had these big black saucer eyes like zombies <laughs> it's such a short scene <laughs> and it's so like the lens that they use is almost like that fisheye lens that he looks a little yes. bugged out you know it's so great that is so great he really sums it up because the whole town has <laughs> gone nuts Crazy. and andy who we thought was nuts. Right. Now is the only scene accurate. Person. He's the only one who's completely accurate. Yeah. Well, versus the scene with Daphne and Sam on the dock, where I do not envy mm. Ashley Jones, who has to take this all this exposition and somehow yeah. make it this, you know, really intense, cool drama. And I think she and Sam did a really good job of sort of, you know, making that um, you know, kind of Manson girl you know, kind Mm -hmm. of obsessive cult dialogue really work. You know, I'm obsessed with that lake Mm. pond thing because, and I don't know if we can say this enough, (laughs) that that thing is filled with water only when we're shooting in it and they heat it and it costs a billion dollars, a gazillion dollars, and it's only three feet deep. So, right. So like, 
And the prosthetics yes. on her back would fall apart if she was in the water for yep. too long. So they did that part first. Well, and they're, you and can then see go back. too, they're shooting to avoid her back as best as they can. Totally. So they don't have to. Totally. You can totally to. see it. Well, my favorite is they're on them. She goes yep. to go jump in the water and they pan the camera away because she can't actually jump in the water. It's too shallow. No, it's too So there's shallow. this amazing sound effect of a dive yes. that is completely foley. Yes. It's just faked in. Completely foley. Yeah. And it's amazing how it works. Yes. You know, we buy we it. We totally buy it because then and, it pans over and yeah. she's in the water. So I love that, you know, while the camera's off her, Ashley is scrambling to get in the water as quick as she can. Yes. And look like she dived. <laughs> but she does such a great job paddling around yes. in this water. Yeah. Sharing all of the dark secrets that we finally get to know. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, speaking, she's she's spilling secrets about Marianne, the Maynad. We now have a name for what Marianne is, or God, if you want that. Yeah. So speaking of her, we have this moment with Mishka the vegan and the dead rabbit. Yeah. Uh, Mishka the vegan. Mishka the vegan. Um, so yes, there, there's an interesting tidbit about that, if you'd like to share, Kristen. Mm -hmm. Do you see? It's catching on. I told you. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah, so Mishka the vegan. Um, Mishka and I like to go and have vegan meals and talk all things vegan. And- and I did not know about this. This is so cool. So yeah. they did get some roadkill mm -hmm. and we're going to use that. But they also got for her like a PETA approved fake dead rabbit. Yeah. But and that one ended up looking better. Yeah. So that's the one. And they, they and so that's the one they use. And they said Mishka was game for whatever needed to be done. But you also found out that because, you know, she's got to cut up that heart. Yep. Yep. And then they've got to be eating the stew. So apparently they, was it episode two or three or four? The meat stew is spooned out by Carl. The camera pans away and a prop person switches out the spoon for a veggie version before the camera gets back yes. to her. So I believe, you know, Carl's at the stove and he spoons out this big heaping thing with a bunch of, you know, meat in it gives it to her. As she brings it to her lips, the camera goes away to find Tara. <laughs> Meanwhile, while, you know, while routine is trying not to laugh, someone has run in with another spoon that only has Brandly. veggies on it and switched it out so that when they turn back to Mishka, she's got the, the veggie version. <laughs> They're so good with us. So good. You know, I didn't have to eat for seven years on this show, but I have had to. Yes, it's and hard. It's hard. It's hard. And it's awful. But in the same vein of like respect towards animals, and we will do a whole deep dive on this because we worked with a lot of animals on the show. Yeah. But for now, you know, animals have a ton of rights and stuff when you use an animal actor. So in this one, we have yeah, an owl. Not enough, but yes. The owl came with multiple handlers to make sure that everything yeah. was on the up and up. Her name was Periwinkle. She had a close up. They were shooting and, and apparently she got three good takes in and something spooked her. Yeah. And again, because it's very important, the handlers had everyone stay absolutely silent for 30 minutes while Periwinkle got it together and did one last take. And I think in the end, unfortunately, they didn't actually use yeah, <laughs> that didn't, footage. Didn't, yeah. They only used the flyaway. Rayel said something along the lines of, this is the weirdest show on television. A four foot owl, a woman covered in mud with claws, chasing someone down the road, yelling at him like he's a dog. He's naked. This is the best job in the world. <laughs> and it is. But also sometimes it it's is. a really hard job. We'll move into yeah. Alexander Skarsgård this episode, Ugh. who was dreadfully ill. Like, like scary. Ill. Like scary. Like we need to shoot him out and get him home kind of sick. Mm -hmm. Ralph said he was worried. Yeah, yeah. She was worried about him. Like he was having to lean on yeah, the wall. Yeah, you can see he's a little slower on his feet and holding the one. Now, mm -hmm. this is a daytime episode for vampires, and he's very mm -hmm. emotional missing his maker. Mm -hmm. So I think it's interesting that that kind of coincided and that, in a way, the vulnerability of being sick didn't work against yeah. him in this moment because he didn't yes. have to be big and powerful. So yeah. it's, it's an interesting thing to sort of watch that performance back and go, oh, you know, he really does seem vulnerable. And, and he was personally in that moment. He does. And, you know, back in the day, in the before mm -hmm. times, you just worked sick. Yeah. I mean, if you weren't bleeding out, you were on that set. Yep. And because it costs like 
our show, I think, was around three hundred and fifty thousand dollars to reschedule a day, yeah. and so they'd have to file an insurance claim. Well, and that's the thing. And like, uh, as an actor, you yeah. can't get a substitute. You can't get somebody else to come do it because it's no. your face. So when an actor is sick, it's you have to reschedule around it. And normally, yeah, you got to have like a hospital yeah. note for them to get that insurance. Yeah. But now I think I've heard mm -hmm. that. If you're sick, they're like, oh, my God, stay home. You know, at this point, it's not necessarily a bad thing that we now start right. offering a bit more support for when actors are not feeling well. Right. And now for a quick bite. Vampire 101, The Bleeds. Are you a vampire unable to stay awake during the day? Do you find your strength and energy sapped, resulting in elegant lounging on white leather furniture? Do your ears and nose begin to leak blood? Are you prone to nausea and dramatic monologuing? If this sounds like you, you might be suffering from the bleeds. Hello, I am Pamela Swinford de Beaufort, creator of New Blood, and we have an answer for you. Try our new O-negative AM for those nights when you need just a few more hours. A new blend, entirely organic, derived from the genetic material of humans annoyingly self-described as early risers. It'll get you out of the coffin and back in business. New Blood O Negative AM does not provide protection from the sun. Younger vampires may need a larger dosage to see results. If your bleeds persist for longer than four days, please consult Dr. Luckwick. So one thing that I thought was so interesting, mm -hmm. Deb, was that this Bill and Lorena, I mean, these flashbacks yeah. are so insane. And we talk about them with Mariana. Yes. Later this it, episode, stick around. It's incredible. Yeah. It's such an incredible interview. She's so remarkable. Mm -hmm. But there was some interesting things in the commentary that I wouldn't have thought of. And mm. one is that this is the episode that establishes what happens to a vampire when they don't get to sleep. Yes, we start with the, the bleeds. bleeds. Yeah. So I Which don't is, think I realized, yeah. I don't think I clocked that that was invented on True Blood that you start bleeding. Yes, from your, and specifically from the ears and nose. And what's, what's really a fun, you know, behind the scenes bit of that is that the ear blood is very easy to forget about when you're taking mm. your makeup off. So yes. the number of times I've gone to the grocery store after Me I've wrapped too. shooting with blood in my ears and I <laughs> see too. like the checkout person staring at me and I'm like, what? <laughs> They're like, are you OK? Because they think I've had a stroke and I'm bleeding from my ears <laughs> and I have to go, Me oh, no, too. no. I'm an actor. <laughs> yes. And, and you know, they also would often put it on with the blood that is paint, basically, yes. that's alcohol-based. So you've got to remove it with alcohol. You and can't just wipe it with a washcloth. Yeah. You, you can't. You shower and it's still there. Yeah. Right. And then if I was also, after a while, if I was working again the next day, I wouldn't even try or care. <laughs> yes. And it's down in your ear. Well, I mean, yeah. The, like, again, days later using a Q-tip and being like, oh, that's still there. Days How do I get rid of this? Last month I found some, Dad. Oh, my like, goodness. Like, it really, <sighs> I really need to bathe more. But I thought that whole sequence mm -hmm. was so stunning. And to hear them talk about it on how they, they kept simplifying it mm -hmm. and simplifying mm -hmm. it because it was supposed to be like a fight, you know, yeah. and heavy stunts. Lots of like flying across the room and more vamp speed. And both, you know, we've got this like twin conversation going. We've got, mm. you know, present day with Bill and Lorena now, and then the past, their sort of divorce, really. And so in both of those worlds, they had all of this vamp speed and flying and throwing and breaking things. And they said the more and more they looked at it, the writer and the director, and then bringing in Steve and Mariana, the more and more they wanted the intensity to be between the two of them. So obviously there is still some physicality to it, but I love how connected they are. It's devastating. Yeah. It's really devastating. And after having talked to Mariana, mm -hmm. and again, she'll really go into this, but then also hearing Rael, mm -hmm. I really see another side of this where I just feel for yeah, Lorena because really she do. has been hopelessly in love with someone for over a hundred years. Yes. Well, and there's this really, the end of their flashback scene is really so devastating. Oh. 
You know I don't love you. You have never tried. I have spent decades trying. I despise myself for what I did for you. God help me, I killed innocent people to prove to you that I loved you. But it was pure nihilism. I do not. I cannot. I will never love you. Oh, God. And her face is just devastating. And what it reminds me of, because, you know, we started this season with the opposite from Bill, mm. with a declaration of love for Suki. And it's fascinating. I don't know if she did it on purpose, Rael, or if it's mm -hmm. just the way Bill speaks, but he uses some very similar language. End of the first episode, he says, I will not and cannot lose you. I felt something I thought was lost to me forever. I love you. Mm. And it's literally like what Lorena is just wanting to hear more than anything mm. in the world. And instead she gets the opposite. Oh, it's so painful. Yeah. We've all, probably all of us have experienced it. And almost every movie and TV show has this element <laughs> in it. Every song, yeah. right? It's just one of the more painful things in human existence. Yeah. Right? So the, and think about, you know, I've been devastated after a relationship ended after three years. A hundred mm. years. Oh. Yeah. Well, and, you know, the, one of the themes that they talk about, mm -hmm. the writer and the director, is this concept of being trapped. Yes. That a number right. of our characters are are confined. Literally, mm -hmm. Bill is being held. Sookie's being held. Jason is being held. Mm -hmm. But it is also this emotional trapping, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there, yeah. Lorena is trapped by her feelings for Bill, I would say, yeah. in many ways. Yeah. Um, but one thing that fascinates me is the way they're actually using the camera and things to really establish that feeling so that we as watchers also feel that kind of claustrophobic mm -hmm. feeling, especially with mm -hmm. Bill and Lorena. It's these really close shots where the whole frame is filled with their bodies or their face yeah. um, and everything in the background is very blurry. So you feel like you're very tight. And then there's this incredible shot but from outside the window of the hotel. And, and Ruscio describes it as four shots in one because you now don't have to do coverage of that moment. It's You can get all, all that you need in the one shot. Right. But it's the frame, the cell of that window that, that you know frames them in, traps yeah. them in there. Bill, Lorena in the background, and then the reflection of the city skyline in the, in wow. the window. It's a really gorgeous shot. So I recommend if you are watching through that you really kind of take notice of that. Yeah, that's so beautiful and so much care goes into setting up shots like that. Yeah. So we also have Suki. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in literal jail in the a church camp basement. Yeah, and they talked about how they filmed that that they wanted mm -hmm. to not put the camera on the other side of that fence so that we would be seeing them as if they were in the jail and they make a very yeah. conscious choice when they put the camera inside that barrier. Yeah. So when, when Steve and Sookie are talking, it's always through the fence. Mm -hmm. And then when Sookie and Hugo are talking, we're now inside, but we're always seeing the fence and the walls around them, which is really fascinating. And then it's a, it's a great moment. And most actors <laughs> will understand this kind of technical thing, but there's a moment when the camera pushes in on Sookie through the chain link fence. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can just sense like, keep her eyes in the holes, you know, like don't let right. a bar cross over her eye line because we want to see her eyes right to the end. And that's a really like threading the needle kind of it shot. Is. So, you know, big props to Simon Jays, who I'm sure managed to keep that steady for them. Yeah. And it's a thing for the actor because you, you can kind of feel it. Yes. But you can't, of course, look down the lens to see <laughs> if you're in the right spot. Exactly. And, you know, Rael and throughout the commentary, Rael and Michael Ruscio talk about how brilliant Anna is. Yes. I mean, she's just such a consummate performer yeah. and hits all these emotional notes, but yet is, I mean, that incredible sequence at the end, yeah, you know, that so brutal hard. attack. I mean, it must be so hard as a writer mm -hmm. 
to mm-hmm. write something like that and then go, oh, God, someone actually has to enact that. And I know Rael talking about really wanting it to be hard to watch, that it, it shouldn't mm-hmm. be funny or sexy or anything like mm-hmm. that, that it, it's really this is a horrific moment and it should feel horrifying. Yeah, it's pretty horrifying. Mm-hmm. And then the relief and the surprise. Yeah. When Godric appears is extreme. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's a it's a great button to that, you know, episode because this is, you know, we've been looking for him for so long. Yeah. And it's great, you know, the, to know that, you know, he wasn't he wasn't trapped of all of our characters. He was Right. That's a good point. Potentially there of his own free will because if he can just get into that cell, he's got more freedom than than we thought he did. Just a side note about the just a little tidbit. The um, it'll catch on the games that the art department, I mean, the art mm-hmm. department is so unbelievable. You don't, It's so seamless. You don't even yes. notice it yes. which, with all the professionals on this show. But those games that they create. <laughs> right. Right. Jesus Christ, Vampire Exterminator, Silver and Stakes and Send Him Back to Hell, which is <laughs> pretty great pieces there, which I love. And then finally, we have Jason, who, you know, I think is first trapped emotionally. And we'll talk about that because he's he's just slept with Sarah, a married woman in the balcony of her husband's church. Sure. Um, (laughs) Sure. And she immediately professes her love. I thought I loved Steve, but I never even knew what love was until you just showed me. Wow, that's uh, intense, huh? I know. (laughs) (laughs) He didn't see that coming. didn't see that coming. I mean, (laughs) she's in love. She's ready to just... She's like, well, we'll tell him. We'll leave. We'll spend the rest of our life together. I love that he's like, that's intense. She's like, I know. You know, two people having polar opposite oh experiences. God. Well, because then well, that's a little intense. She's so happy about it. And then oh Jason God. replies when she's like, we have to tell Steve. And it's so wonderful. Let's just think about this for a second. A, Steve has guns. Then there's the lockdown tomorrow night. And secondly, we're going to be locked in this church with Steve and his guns all night. <laughs> I, know. I mean, he's talking sense. He is talking sense. It's very, <laughs> Steve is a dangerous person. Yeah. And then what's even more fun is, of course, this episode ends with actually not Steve and a gun, but Sarah and a gun. Yeah, that's really good. That's really good. She shoots him. Yes. In the heart. In the heart. And, you know, we'll find out next week what comes of that. But mm-hmm. before that happens, Jason has quite an arc this episode. You know, he's sort of kidnapped by Steve and Gabe. And they have this really intense scene where he's got a knife to his throat and they're, you know, sort of mm-hmm. interviewing him and they, they're they misunderstanding each other. <laughs> Jason thinks it's about Sarah and Steve thinks it's about Sookie. And that's a really fun and, and that's uh, a fun scene thing. And apparently, so Ruscio shared, Michael shared that they had actually shot that scene with a lot more movement and a lot more sort of bigger choices and they shot quite a bit of it. And the actors actually came back and said, eh, it's not really working for us. Can we try it a bit more contained? And again, to True Blood's credit, they said, all right, even though that makes what we've done before not usable, let's do it. And what they yeah. ended up using is what's in the show now, which is this much more intense, confined conversation. So I, I'm again, I'm always so impressed with the trust and respect that that mm-hmm. production had for each member of its, you know, of the cast and crew. And then we have, I'd love to just throw it out to Greg Collins, who plays Gabe. So yep. Greg is a, or was a professional football player. Yeah, <laughs> He was a linebacker. He played for the San Francisco 49ers, the Seattle Seahawks, and uh, my father's hometown team, the Buffalo Bills. He also played mm-hmm. in college for uh, Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. But the interesting thing they said is that, so, you know, Gabe, the character is this horrible, mean, angry, vicious person. But Greg himself is the nicest guy you'd ever meet. <laughs> that that um, he was such a joy and a pleasure to have on set. And the only trouble they ever had with him <laughs> was that sometimes he was too nice as Gabe. Um, right. And they had to sort of encourage him to be more uh, more evil, which is just such a, you know, if you're going to have a, <laughs> if you're going to have to give someone a note more than once, it better be that one. 
Yes, that is so funny. At the end of the day, the interesting thing about all of these people who are trapped, right? Yeah. Is that at the end, what they really needed to hear was truth. And that is the only thing that's going to allow them to be able to escape. Because look, for Bill and Lorena, she is stronger than him. She is older than Mm -hmm. him. She is faster than him. She even says Mm -hmm. it. But the only way he's going to be able to get out there is by having these conversations with her about the truth of their relationship and the truth Mm -hmm. of where he is now. Mm -hmm. When we get to Sookie and Hugo in the jail, right? Hugo does some real truth talking about what it is to be the Mm -hmm. human companion to a vampire and that that is not all it's cracked up to be. That she is sitting here in a jail and no one has come to get her. And, you know, I think those realizations that she's actually kind of on her own is, you know, that's what she's going to need to learn going forward on this. And then Jason and Sarah, you know, they have this big, (laughs) this big secret about (laughs) who they are. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, they don't really know each other. You know, Mm -hmm. they they think that they're on the same page with vampire hating and their feelings for one another, but they are Mm -hmm. on opposite pages And, you know, I think by the end of this with her shooting him, (laughs) things will be a little clearer. Things will be a little clearer to both of them. And then we have Godric, who, you know, we've spent seven episodes thinking, trying to find him, thinking that he was being held against his will. And he's there fine. And now. I am so excited to introduce the interview with Mariana Clavino. Oh, she is just absolutely unbelievable as Lorena. <laughs> She's also a friend. She's so funny. I love seeing her. This interview is just, oh, just delicious for me. I can't wait to hear how Lorena came to be. Yes. Oh, and did she come to be? Hi, Mariana. Hello. Hi. It is so nice to see your faces. Me too. It's been so long. It is so nice. <sighs> very, to see very you. long. But we we've been staring at your face quite a bit recently. So. I know. I know. It's, it's decidedly less smiley. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies. No, never apologize for Lorena. Never, oh, no. never apologize it is for a Lorena. Joy. I mean, it's uh, been so much fun. And I don't know if Kristen shared with you or not, but she and I, this is sort of our first time watching the series. So because you and I didn't work together, I didn't actually end up seeing very much of your work. So for me, this is like, oh, oh my God, she's so amazing. So, uh, well, really thank you, cool. but you mm-hmm. never watched the show when no. it was really. <laughs> no, I don't watch my yeah. own work. So this is a, this is wow. a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This is a During waking... this podcast is a waking nightmare. Nightmare. <laughs> but but what it means is that the highlight really is watching all of these people that I know and love and who I've seen their work in person. Yeah. But to now sort of see mm-hmm. what all together that culmination is. I mean, mm-hmm. gosh, Lorena is fascinating and so complex. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think we mm-hmm. think of her as a villain. Yes. But boy, is there a lot more going on than that. Mm-hmm. I always liked to think so. <laughs> I mean, we can jump in with, do we want to start with how you got the part? So it was an audition that came in just like any of the many auditions that we get. I just knew it was Alan Ball's new show for HBO and that's all I needed you know, to know to get super excited about it. <laughs> and I remember having the instinct that, and you know, I don't always get strong instincts with audition material. I don't know about you mm-hmm. guys. Sometimes it's just sort of like, whatever. But this, I had a really strong instinct Mm. that I should not play it safe. Mm. I just sort of felt like, I Ah. feel like this is a part slash character slash show where it's not going to serve me to be timid or safe. Like I need to be bold. Uh So I made some choices that probably weren't, as we say, I I, I was never going to play it that way on the day, but I kind of... (laughs) Wanted to, which in a lot of auditions you do, you go in and you play it exactly right. how you would play it on the day, which is what we say when you're actually going to going to film it. But I sort of felt like they need to be able to see where I'm willing to take this character. Right. And so I kind of pushed it in terms of her 
being a little unhinged and yeah. far uh-huh. more in touch with her emotions than I think we're used to seeing vampires. And so I really kind okay. of made some bold choices. And I, I went in there looking as innocent as I possibly could. I mean, I <laughs> curled my hair into like little sweet ringlets and I wore like a little lace top. Because oh it would it was, be the period, right? It was it was the Civil yes. War era scene. Yeah. And I felt okay. and I felt how how much more frightening it is to experience that turn and, and as an actor, you know, be able to serve that turn, not just have it be, you know, coming in like a vampire. What, what was funny is that I get there and all of the other actors, not to disparage my fellow actors out there, <laughs> they all looked like Elvira. Like they were right, all dressed course. up, totally gothed <laughs> up, red lipstick. <laughs> like they were dressed up like vampires and I was the only one at least at that time, who didn't look like that. And I barely wore any makeup. Like, I was just sweet, 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 sweet. And and were you thinking, oh, shit? Or were you thinking, okay, you know, no, good choice? Normally, I do think, oh, shit, because I've definitely been on the other right, side right. of, oh, I, I got this one wrong. Like, everybody else is like... <laughs> right, right. But oh, no. this was maybe the rare occasion where I was like, yeah, I don't think that's right, guy. Like, I feel like, huh. I feel mm-hmm. like this is where she is. So... I went in and I read with Junie and Libby, the best casting directors in the biz. Yes. And Alex Wu yes. was there. Ugh. And I think it went well. And I think we did it maybe a couple of times or something. And then they brought me back in and it was just back in for producers. I didn't know Alan was going to be there, but he was there. And I think some of the other writers and that was it. And I just went in. I think Alan had a couple notes for me and I redid huh. it. And then I waited a few days and then and then I got the good news. But it was only a guest star possible recurring at that point. Right. Right. And then when after season one, we got the we got the magical call that they were asking me to join the cast. And so it was like <laughs> the magical such call. a magical call. Yeah. I was just like hoping that I would get brought back for, you know, another <laughs> guest star or something. It was like, no, we want you to join the cast. I'm yeah. like, oh. Well, Alex Wu, we yeah. interviewed him, and he the word that I remember for you was luminous. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. That's nice. Isn't that a great word? <laughs> oh, I know. I know. But you really, really, really are. Oh, and you. as yeah. Lorena in that first season, we covered it in the season mm-hmm. one of this podcast, but it really was fantastic yeah. that we do not see the vampire Lorena no. coming. And then in season two here, this episode, 207. There's so much well, in the whole season. The entrance. I think we have to start with the oh. entrance because I okay. actually. Okay, we got to start. With I went the back entrance. and reread the script, and I mean, they set you up. I mean, they were like they did. the dress, the, the dress. earrings, the necklace, the music. The, I mean, they were <laughs> yeah. like, we want to give Mariana every you know advantage in this yeah. moment, and boy, does that entrance down that hallway oh. just sing. Thank you. The slow mo. Yeah. You know what? And the way you're What is that? Is that pressure? Out? Like, you think, like, isn't this great? But maybe it's like, how do I live up to this? What's Honestly, there? that shot took so many takes because Did it was it? like, <laughs> you think that that's like going to be the easiest thing to yeah. just like stroll down, like power walk <laughs> with the fans blowing and... And then to stop, because I think it was scripted that I have like some sort of evil look on my face or something. I forget how it was scripted. I think it just wasn't working. And and then it just was looking silly or so, I don't know. And finally, the director gave me like a great little nugget, which was just like, just think about him. Just think like, don't, you know, be yeah. evil. And I was like freaked out. I think it was the first thing I <laughs> shot. It was like all freaked out. Like, right. And so then it was a much more sort of like pensive, you know, look, which worked so much better than any of the other schlock right. I was serving up in the previous takes. But I think, <laughs> I think, I think that look like took so many takes. And it was like right before lunch. And I was just like already like internally panicking, like, oh God, right, oh God, right. I'm not getting this. I'm not getting right. this. Oh no. Right. What ended up happening was a moment mm. that was captured forever. Mm. They really did give me m- yeah. moments, silhouettes, uh, yes. costumes, yes. the costumes. Yes. <gasps> I mean, we'll get into the it because you're flashbacks. Into stuff. Into I mean, Fisher, you're really but... the queen of flashbacks <laughs> on this show. Although I want to say this right before we quickly go on because I found the script here. So yes, it's Lorena walks down the broad hall outside Ooh. their room, maybe in slow-mo. Dressed in something that flows and a 1930s style necklace, she hears Sookie and Bill making love with her super vampire hearing. 
Lorena stops walking, smiles, wicked, flashing fang. And that's <laughs> like this the wicked build up smile. Well, you did the that. wicked smile yeah. just sort of was not work. Whatever I was serving up was not working. And it, just, <laughs> it took it took some some direction to get me. It's exciting. <laughs> Pulled back so in. before we jump totally into the flashback scenes, because that, you know, that's on the screen. The one fascinating thing to me about Lorena, and correct me if I'm wrong, we know nothing about her human life. Nothing. What did you, was, did you want to come up with something or was that okay with you? I did come up with oh. a history of my own that I don't, I don't feel a little shy sharing, but I just will say like, it felt right to me that she had a very difficult human life and that mm. she was yes. brutalized and exploited mm. and really yes. hurt by mm. men in her human life, which then really informs her sort of just tragic yeah. search for love in her vampire life. And she, of course, wants mm. the one vampire who proved himself to be honorable and has, right. you know, kind of been able to maintain his humanity in a way. And that's preventing him from ever loving her. <laughs> so it's like she mm -hmm. wants the thing that will never love her back. And that's yeah. kind of her tragedy yeah. to me. So I always saw her as such a tragic character. I just yeah. always like wanted yeah. to just like hold her if I, <laughs> you know, stepped outside of her for a moment, just, oh, sweetie, you're so broken. You are so broken. Yeah. So broken. Because she just wanted, she wanted that love and she wanted it from somebody who was good. Mm. And right. um, somebody good was never going to love her. <laughs> like she could have gotten someone right. to adore her who was, you know, a, a, a jerk vampire, but that's not what she wanted. I think she wanted what she never had in her human life. Anyway, that's kind of where I was coming from. Yeah. Well, it's all in there. I feel like that. I mean, I practically transcribed <laughs> one of the scenes from this episode because he says, you are the saddest, mm. loneliest creature I've ever known. Yeah. And, she's, and she says in there, men have readily laid down their lives just to spend one night with me. What more can I give? What is it that you want from mm -hmm. me? She really wants this one mm -hmm. She, I mean, how painful, yeah. so painful, how excruciating for, for all her backstory. She wants love from this, from one, this one person. person. And I would always, and he's not, he's not going to love he's her. He's never going to love her. And I would always say that to Ugh. like in interviews or whatever, when people would ask me about the love triangle, so to speak, which was never really a triangle <laughs> because Bill was never interested in me, but I I said, you know what? She's loyal. You know, Sookie mm. gets yeah. tempted by Sam and mm -hmm. other right. other people come around like Lorena. Uh-uh. She was one man <laughs> all the time. <laughs> Say what you will. Right. All Bill all day. She was yeah. all Bill all day. But uh, no, you're right. I think that right. she, she, to me, was just so tragic for whatever reason, you know, that mm. he represented everything that could make it all better for her and, and could mm. really fix her, I think, and fill that hole. And it was just never going to work. And that scene, yes, that scene got her mm. in that green what dress. Scene. In that yes. green dress. <gasps> that dress, that green dress. Yeah, I think Marco Ruscio, I think, who, who directed Ooh. that episode, talked about he was like, we wanted the Anne Bancroft moment for, for Lorena, <laughs> where like uh -huh. it's that super slinky slip dress where you can see her abs acting, you know? Yeah. Like you can see <laughs> yeah. the breath right. drop in. The breath the, drop in. Oh, you know, all of that. And, and it's funny because after after hearing that, I was like, I'm watching that scene and you are acting with at, like from your fingertips out of every pore. It's just amazing. Yeah. Oh, thank you. you I mean, you hit every color, yeah. every emotion in that scene. And so much of True Blood was, we just interviewed Romeo Tarone yesterday. Aww. And yeah. And he talks about how there was never really scenes with two people. And I'm like, yeah, most of your scenes were two people and you were with Steven yeah. acting your balls off and having quite a relationship. Yeah. And that scene Boy, it covers, I mean, you have so many great arcs in this series. 
But that scene for me has every color of that relationship. In that whole episode, I think it's it's two oh seven, right? I think with which is mm -hmm. you guys are you're you're trapped in that hotel room. We're getting the flashbacks yeah. to the thirty with the release and all of these, you know, torturous moments yes. that are happening. I mean, the whole episode really feels like a Bill Lorena love story and divorce, mm -hmm. right? All in yes. one. And I and I, I love to hear your take on it. For her to st for her to release him was so big, and it was just yeah. I don't know that I ever quite like. I never felt like I really nailed it. Like I ne we did it many times, and I just never felt like I really got there. I'm glad that you feel that it it was there on on screen. And it's funny to think about. Oh, it's it's a sexy vampire show, but man, the emotional roller coasters that mm -hmm. we would go on. We're, mm. I don't know that I've gone on them in any other show mm. that I've worked on mm. to that extent where you go to so yes. many places and the stakes are so high. Mm -hmm. Pardon the pun. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. You're not right. the first to make it. <laughs> uh, it's just, you know, it, it truly was a, was a gymnastic, you know, kind of acting gymnastics in a lot of ways between yeah. the emotional yeah. places we had to go, the physical things that we would have to do which is mm -hmm. such a gift as an actor. I mean, it was mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. such a gift. I feel like Lorena had more of those than most. Mm -hmm. She may have because most of the time she was miserable in, mm -hmm. <laughs> in the mm -hmm. flashbacks. It was right, always, right. you know, in a lot of ways it was to serve Bill's story too, to sort of, sure. you know, give right. us where Bill had come from and his um, how he was mm -hmm. made and how he had spent his first decades as a vampire and and just, and to mm -hmm. juxtapose that to how he was living his life now and choosing to live his his vampire life now but for myself for Lorena it was all just it was all so just a heart yeah. rendering and it was just mm -hmm. so hard but those flashback scenes were really beautiful and I, I always wanted more, of course. I always wanted more yeah. more history. Yeah. I always wanted yeah. more, more, more. Um, <laughs> I was always yeah. feeling greedy about that because I just wanted, you know, I just, I, I wanted more. And I was fascinated by yeah. what, what, what else, went, what else happened? What else went on with them? Like, where Absolutely. else did they go? Well, what else? frankly, I mean, you're my grandmaker yes. and we never even met. We and never I was got always to meet. like, what? Right. Would that have been? You know, like what would that have been? I know. We, with Jessica's impulsive nature and all of the, the drama and misery of her life, I was always <laughs> like, wow, they might have been a really interesting, like, get into a lot of nasty trouble kind of pair for a while. I feel like I would have tried yeah. to corrupt you, yeah. most likely. I would have for used sure. you somehow to, I think, to get to Bill. But I feel like I also could have given you some, I don't know, some yeah. vampire, you know. You could have nuggets privilege. of wisdom for sure. <laughs> for sure. I also feel like I feel like Jessica could have filled that that void for, for Lorraine. Jessica's very Maybe. quick to love. She oh <laughs> Jessica. Jessica is quick to love. But I was gonna say that you mentioned, Kristen, that most of my scenes were with Steve. And that's true. Yeah. Most of my work in season three, it yeah. branched out a little bit, but especially right. for the first first two seasons, it was all Steve all the time. And so yeah. Yeah. We really got to have a kind of shorthand with each other, which was mm. nice. And he's so funny and so lovely. And even though I was he's playing so funny and lovely. his mommy, in some ways, he felt like a big brother to me because I was right. always so nervous being on right. set and just always felt like I was, you know, screwing up. And he doesn't have that feel like he just feels so calm yeah. and yeah. comfortable and he's he's a director's mm -hmm. actor like in a way that I mean like he yes. is a director now himself mm -hmm. and, and a very talented one but he's one of those actors that thinks like a yes. director I am not yes. like I <laughs> yes. Yes, am too. not I will yeah. never think that way I yeah. always think with mm -hmm. my blinders on I'm always just actor 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 and I he yeah. was so great mm -hmm. it just you know coaxing me to bring my chin up so I was more in the light or so that uh, the light would hit my tear and you know just like the little uh, technical things yeah. that he would always sort of be right there with me to kind of help guide me through and I'm so grateful for him he was a lovely scene performer as much as I wanted to have other scenes with other actors <laughs> it was nice it was nice having having all of that journey yeah. with him yeah and tell us, I I have one, I want to talk about hair mm -hmm. and makeup and costume because holy mm. hell. Now, how do they do the eyebrows when it's just a line? <laughs> how do they get rid of your eyebrows? Those eyebrows, 
So they put a prosthetic to cover my eyebrows. Because right. they don't want you to not have eyebrows. They <laughs> couldn't you know. actually yeah, they shave, shave our eyebrows. Yeah. So, the, so they, they made would've. eyebrow prosthetics, but I think it didn't quite look that great. So I think they did have to do some, some magic, some computer huh. CG magic and, okay. and kind of erase some of that. Because then they drew over the prosthetic, the little, the little right. pencil eyebrows because right. I was really looking for it and that makes sense because there were a couple of moments where I was like oh I can see I can see <laughs> yeah. real eyebrow and then no I couldn't so that makes I, sense that they had to help I think that they out. had to help that that's out. really challenging yeah. it felt really weird and too did, acting because it was sort of like I half bet. your face was glued and it was kind of weird but right right yes that's what I was thinking so Lorena really you went through it with stunts Blood, yeah. emotions, mm -hmm. costumes, hair. What an amazing character. It was so, I mean. What an amazing what character. A gift. I, right? What a gift. I was pretty well immersed in in the series and in the history. And I kind of looked mostly at, at Kristen and Alex's performance. Mm. And they were just the epitome of cool yeah. you know they were just <laughs> cool cats who had it all yeah. sort of under wraps and with the one-liners and I yeah. thought how do I distinguish myself coming in as a vampire I'm already different from Bill because mm -hmm. Bill's sort of yeah. his own breed of vampire mm -hmm. but I thought I think she should always be a little unhinged, mm -hmm. <laughs> not like she's, That's she's, she's word. dressed to the nines and looks great, but she's, I always felt like she was a pot with a lid on that was like mm -hmm. always almost ready to just blow mm -hmm. off. And you never kind of right. knew what was going to happen, when it was going to happen, what she was capable of. And I, yeah. I liked that right. about her, that it wasn't, cause I felt like the series needed, I, they didn't need one more cool vampire. They yeah. needed, you know, a right. little something different. So I wanted her to have yes. that quality of, of yeah, of being unhinged and a little bit of a question mark. <laughs> it's it's well, interesting hearing you say it now. Uh -huh. There's that moment you yeah. walk into Godric's where you're going to sort of confront Sookie. Yes, and I can that's what see I was you say. trying to play, like yes. Lorena, trying, trying to, be to play an Eric. <laughs> The cool, cool vampire. Man. But she's just, yeah. that isn't who she is. She's in not. Her heart. And she leaves that scene in tears yeah. saying, like, why don't you that ever love another, me? <laughs> that is another really intense. I mean, you really had, when you came to Ooh. work, you had some intensity. There are no I had, easy I'm going to ask scenes. you. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't. And I'm going to ask you about your training in that a bit. But the, I wrote down that line where Godric says about Lorena. You're an old vampire, I can tell. You've had hundreds of years to better yourself, and yet you haven't. You're still a savage. Mm. A savage. <laughs> I fear I for all of us, humans wrong. and vampires. I think he's a little vicious. He's savage. He was vicious, yeah. Yes. But he, he's I going through his own that that impressive <laughs> end of life thing. He's projecting. <laughs> no, he's he, projecting a little bit. I, yeah. <laughs> no, she did not evolve. She didn't. She is savage. Mm. She is she, I, I think Godric was on it. Huh? She is freaking unhinged. Is. Yeah, yeah. This is a show and an opportunity to just let it all hang out. Yeah. You got to come to play. And that wow. is what I will say about every actor on that show, even yeah. though I didn't get to work with most of them. Everyone came to play yeah. and throw down. Like everyone yeah. was there to throw <laughs> down. Nobody was there to like play it cool. And even though we were playing cool a lot of the time, <laughs> right? there's a difference between the actor maintaining yeah. their their coolness or, you know, their yeah. whatever, uh, their sense of keeping it together. Like, no, we really had to let it all out. We created a world that people wanted to, wanted to get in and play around in and be a part of. And that doesn't come around every day. And we were very lucky to have been a part of it. And when you think of your experience on the show, are there three words that come to mind? <gasps> Ugh. I mean, sadly, the first one is probably nervous because I just felt so nervous, especially at the beginning that I was yeah. screwing up. And that's just sad to me that that's. Yeah. <laughs> but to, to be honest, it, yeah. that is part of it. Tragic because I just oh. loved her mm. so much and just felt like she was so tragic. Yeah. And just, I don't know, man, love. Mm. I just loved it. I loved everyone I got to work with. 
So nervous, you know, tragic I love. My acting teacher. Love. Amazing. Nervous, uh, tragic it's love. It's a Madonna song. Amazing. It is. <laughs> yeah. Nervous, tragic love. Well, we are enjoying <sighs> your yes. performance. Thank you so much. So, so excited for season three and everything that comes there. Yes. Well, thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank what you a, for coming. What a pleasure. What a pleasure to see you. I miss your faces. Oh my gosh, so good to see Mariana. Yeah. I love talking to her. <laughs> you know, she is so funny. Like when we get together, <laughs> we laugh and laugh and oh. laugh. She's just such a joy and so smart. Yeah. And she is freaking luminous. Yeah, and I love that you two have stayed close and con you know continue to yeah. share stories and all of that. And in fact, coming up to this interview, I was like, oh, I'm really not that nervous about this one. When I think I texted yeah. you, I was like, because she's a great actress and a good egg, you know, like, I just know it's going to be a that's great she time. Said. And, yeah. you know, and it was, I mean, she's, she's luminous, yeah. but that's, it's interesting because we think of that as being a physical quality, but it is also right. lit from within, right? I mean, it's that soul it that is. shines through one's eyes and, and she has that and you really feel it when you're speaking with her. That's exactly it. She has that light from within. Yeah. Oh, I know. What a what a wonderful thing this podcast. Next week on Truest Blood, the church is on lockdown and war is brewing. Can a radical act of peace from a 2,000-year-old vampire turn the tide? We'll find out. Plus, vampire regeneration. The good, the bad, and the utterly embarrassing. And we speak with our dear friend Michael McMillan, and the one and only Reverend Steve Newland, which, you know what, I'm just realizing I had a dream about him last night. No. And we were somewhere doing something weird and wonderful, and I laughed so hard that it <laughs> woke me up. That's, that is Michael McMillan. And he's one of those mm. actors that we've all seen everywhere with leading roles on What I Like About You, Hot in Cleveland, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, and fan favorite, Beauty in the Briefcase. And he's also a writer and a podcaster, so be sure to listen to Slate Your Name. I did an episode, so did Anna Camp, and Bigfoot Collectors Club for all the Macmillan goodness, which Deb and I both did. I've done an episode. Yep. Yeah, I mean, he is funny, he's full of heart, and just one of our absolute favorite people. You're gonna love it. So thanks for listening, Trubies. Subscribe and follow wherever you listen to your podcasts, and we'll see you next week. Y'all come back now, you hear? Got any burning questions you want answered on Truest Blood? Post them on any and all social media platforms using hashtag fan club questions, and we may feature them on the show. That's hashtag F-A-N-G-C-L-U-B-Q-U-E-S-T-I-O-N-S. Truest Blood is produced by Safe Haven for HBO Max. Executive producers are Janina Gavonkar, Kristen Bauer, and Deborah Ann Wool. Our producer is Gabrielle Galan, and our audio producer is Christopher Wool. Our theme song was recorded just for this podcast by Jace Everett. Additional music was composed by Timo Chen. And remember, you can watch all of the original episodes of True Blood on HBO Max.